Hello, I'm Ken Howe, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar entitled The Evolving Crisis, The Escalating Threat of COVID and Climate Change. Before we get started, let me do a little housekeeping. Let me remind you that you can access closed captions by hitting the CC button at the bottom of your screen. We're here to revisit the issue of the interaction of pandemics like COVID-19 and global climate change. That complex linkage between the two was the subject of our documentary last year. Now we want to see whether we've gained any new insights, whether our assessment of the future has changed in light of both politics and COVID variants such as Omicron, and what research our panelists have undertaken or hope to undertake since last we met. If you haven't seen the documentary, here's a taste of what it was all about. Two major crises have descended upon humanity, climate change and the coronavirus. They may seem independent of each other. In fact, they are very closely linked. The emergence of COVID-19 on top of climate change is a spiraling crisis, and it's just the beginning. As you can see, the culprit when it comes to pandemics and likely COVID-19, all too frequently is climate change and the human actions that cause it. They're not the only reasons, but they are prime reasons why many diseases emerge and spread. Think of it, pandemics like the bubonic plague and the Spanish flu have been with us for a long time, but global viral outbreaks like the coronavirus, which were once fairly rare, have become more common. In just the last 60 years, we've had the Asian flu, the seventh cholera pandemic, the Hong Kong flu, HIV AIDS, SARS, H1N1, or the swine flu, H5N1, avian influenza, MERS, Ebola, Zika, COVID-19. Together, they've caused more than 42 million deaths, according to the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. All of these are zoonotic diseases, those that originate in animals in the wild and are capable of infecting humans. And we've promoted their spread. That's the whole point. Our CO2 emissions have warmed the air, the land, and the oceans, which have dramatically expanded the range of vectors that carry these diseases. As we warm the earth and the oceans and the, and, and, and the air, um, we've dramatically expanded their range. And, and as a result, mosquitoes, flies, ticks, rodents, even snails and phytoplankton have expanded their territories further north and south of the equator and into highly populated temperate zones. At the same time, other human activity that causes or contributes to climate change also play a major role in the spread of zoonotic diseases. Principally, that's through deforestation, which pushes disease-bearing wildlife such as bats, civet cats, chimpanzees into closer contact with people and people into closer contact with them. According to a report from the UN, the underlying causes of pandemics are the same global environmental changes that drive biodiversity loss and climate change. It argues that human damage to biodiversity is a leading cause and is leading us into what it calls a pandemic era. Today, we want to re-examine some of the issues that we investigated in our documentary. And to do so, we've invited back several of the experts who appeared on our earlier presentation. Today, we have Dr. Chip Fletcher, Interim Dean for Academic Affairs, School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. We have Dr. Jim, Th Jim Thompson, Principal Oceanographer, Applied Physics Lab, University of Washington. Dr. Angelique White, Professor, Department of Oceanography, University of Hawaii at Manoa, and Dr. Camilla Mora, Professor, Department of Geography and Environment, University of Hawaii at Manoa. Each panelist will have about 10 minutes. In the first five, they'll address topics that they've, that they've been working on. In the next five minutes, I and other panelists will ask questions. Then there'll be a 20 minute or so Q&A session at the end in which you can ask questions by going to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Let's start with Chip. What is your sense of how much was accomplished at the Climate Change Summit in Glasgow back in October? Uh, more specifically, how would you compare pledges made to national, actual national policies? 
Thank you, Ken. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, it's great to be part of this informa information sharing opportunity. So um, by the close of the COP in Glasgow, the announced promises from the world's uh, nations, the members of the United Nations Framework Conference on Climate Change, basically put us on a pathway to uh, global warming by the end of the century between two and a half and 2.8 degrees Celsius. Now, this may not impress many of you as a high degree of warming, but you need to think of it in terms of the total energy of a closed system, such as your body temperature. If you run a low grade fever of one or two degrees, and that should increase to uh, two, three or four degrees, you are incrementally with just a couple of degrees change moving from um, a uh, somewhat tired, degraded state to eventually into the emergency room at the local hospital. So only a few degrees increase in a closed system such as Earth's atmosphere, um, Earth's surface, uh, can result in major changes in uh, the uh, ecosystems and uh, physical systems that operate there. But uh, pledges or promises from the world's nations as part of the UNFCCC are different than the actual policies that are enacted by uh, the world's nations. And when you analyze nation by nation, and we're talking about, about uh, roughly 198 members of the UNFCCC, we're looking at a pathway of warming that exceeds three degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial temperature. Now at three degrees Celsius, modeling has told us that we're looking at roughly one fifth of the global land surface being unfit for human habitation and potentially one third of all of humanity needing to migrate to new locations in order to find food and water security. Putting this many people into a climate migration status uh, will exacerbate already uh, uh, widespread problems with human equity. It will further degrade uh, ecosystems that we are consuming at alarming rates. In truth, we need to uh, cut our greenhouse gas emissions by roughly half uh, in the next eight years by the end of this, by the end of this decade. Uh, and we need to be at zero emissions uh, by mid-century in order to stop warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius, which has been identified by scientists as a uh, relatively safer level of warming from which uh, and under which we have a better chance of adapting to, to the changes we put in place. Now, unfortunately, as we have emerged from the uh, global recession uh, stimulated by COVID-19, uh, 2021 is already showing us that we have just about made up for the reduction in greenhouse emissions related to the recession in 2020. We've seen a 5% increase in global emissions in 2021. So uh, we really are not coming out of this recession with any significant gains on the global carbon budget. We have a lot of work to do uh, and, and um, the work is is accelerating with uh, every year that we don't make significant progress. You know, Chip, can I jump? I was gonna ask you another question, but what you just said about climate migration, I just wanted to know whether because of that climate migration, does that um, exacerbate the interaction with, with pandemics, with, with, with you know, zoonotic diseases? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, because Hum, hum, displaced human populations bring with them their own uh, diseases, plus they will be disturbing natural ecosystems as they move, needing to survive uh, from natural resources that are available to them. Uh, it puts stress on uh, socioeconomic lifelines, hospital systems, transportation systems, et cetera, uh, reducing the availability of these uh, for everybody. Um, and you know, as the as the climate zones of the planet expand, uh, as the tropics expand, uh, and as vectors that carry these diseases expand, 
uh, all of this movement away from this unlivable zone of the tropics and continental areas, uh, spreading disease will be one among several negative impacts that, that go with it. You know, I also want to mention um, the Washington Post did a study during the COP meeting in Glasgow and found that on average, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions are underreported by the world's nations by 23%. Um, so it, even the numbers I gave you are, are an underestimate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, panelists, do you have any questions for Chip? Actually, I, I would like to add to the, the, to the things that she just add, the reality of this. You know, sometimes when we speak about this, people think about like uh, scenarios in the future. This is as real as it can get. You can see that with the COVID today, right? Like you can see, for instance, when you talk about migration, now people, the, the economies of entire countries being blocked because they cannot trade things from country to country because they are being blocked by COVID. Even billion, millionaires like this tennis player today, it's a stock in Australia because of the regulations that were put in place because of this issue of migration and COVID. So it gets to be very real once these uh, pandemics are, are in the move, uh, especially when it relates to people moving from place to place. You, you, there are multiple consequences beyond just people dying from these things. The fact that the entire economy can go down as we see today with this COVID. You know, in addition to the the... Um, barriers and challenges to global trade uh, that Camilo is mentioning, um, an isolated location like Hawaii needs mm -hmm. to rapidly build its resiliency and self-sustainability mm -hmm. given that global trade is really growing on a more fragile footing. That, that's an excellent point. I think that that is actually one of the most worrisome things for local economies is the fact that that's not going to be cheap. You can imagine what it costs to build an infrastructure for you that is resilient to this. We are talking not only about hospitals, but also immigration officers, police officers. I mean, the whole thing needs to be scaled up. So the cost is brutal, I believe, for local economies when it comes down to increased resilience locally, which again, for me, is the reason why we really need to fix this problem from the beginning, we should just not adapt to it because the adaptation is just going to be super costly, in my opinion. Yeah, I would like to follow on that and, and just say that you know when you, when we when you first said the cost is going to be a, a lot to to build it to do it, but it's so much less than what the cost will be ten years down the road if you don't right. And so really um, making the point that mm -hmm. uh, the investing now in that resilience um, mm -hmm. that's what's going to give communities around the world. Uh, you know, a strong footing for 10 years from now and, and avoid a much bigger cost later. That's a critical point, Jim. Uh, and one that when you're an elected official facing up to the fact that having to spend money now in order to save money when you're out of office uh, mm -hmm. later, that's a difficult decision. It'll take, mm -hmm. a, it'll take a courageous leader to do that. Are we seeing that? Leadership. I think we see it in places. I think we're seeing it at the federal level now. Uh, I think Hawaii is a good example. And I think there are other places in the U.S., the U.S. Climate Alliance, for instance. We have, what is it, 26 states that have signed on to the UNFCCC. These are places dedicated to reducing their emissions. Uh, no, I, but I don't believe at the, quite at the level that we need it, though. You see, for instance, the, the U.S. and the Congress and all of these things. Right now, we are debating how to, whether to invest this thing as part of, uh, of, of that uh, Biden agenda to reduce greenhouse gases. So and we, the, the whole Congress is divided. And in fact, right now, there is even less people supporting that than the people that is in favor of that. So, I mean... Yeah, we need to do it. The, the solutions are there, but we need to have more people getting on it, especially the politicians. This division is kind of uh, playing against us, I believe. Do you think that that sort of the demise of Build Back Better has kind of put a dagger in the heart of, of the change that you might have been hoping for? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, not... Not answering that question in particular, setting the goals is going to be much easier than reaching them, but at least we're having the conversation more so than we had in, in the US in prior years. Hey, let's turn to Jim now. Uh, Jim's a, an oceanographer and has uh, taken several expeditions up to, the, up to the Arctic to study wind, waves, and ice melt. I'm wondering, Jim, whether you've been keeping that in touch with any of the particularly the indigenous people in the Arctic, and how they are dealing with this double threat of, of climate change and COVID. Uh, 
Yeah, so Ken, that's something I have I've spent a lot of time um, in the Western Arctic, so north of Alaska, along the Alaskan North Slope, and there is a, a very vibrant indigenous population there. There are villages like Kaktovik, Utkiadvik, Nuiqsut, Point Lay, Point, and Wainwright, uh, where there have people have been living for generations, for thousands of years, and those communities are communities uh, that have have been living with climate change on a daily basis for a long time. You know, climate change is a global problem that has been at their front door for decades. And so they, they are a really interesting uh, group of people to talk to right now, because now the rest of us have a global problem that came to our front door, right? These global problems have been abstract. Climate change has been pretty abstract for a lot of us, uh, unless you actually work in the field. You know, you don't see it in your day-to-day -day life. But climate change has been in the day-to-day -day life of uh you know, of an Arctic resident for, for quite some time. I can give you a few examples of what they're struggling with. Um, there is less sea ice, dramatically less sea ice than there used to be. And that changes their patterns of day-to-day of -day life in terms of how they get around, they use the sea ice as a, a way to get around and, and to move through the environment. Uh, when the sea ice melts and the permafrost gets soft, uh, you can't travel over the ocean and you can't travel over the land very easily. So it makes it hard to go out and just do subsistence activities, hunting and, uh, and foraging. It makes it hard to get to other communities and uh, you know, have any ex exchange between the communities. So the loss of sea ice and the, the melting of the permafrost has been a big issue just for, for sort of traditional means of transportation, but also for, for how they um, they get food. And so food security has been a huge issue in, in these communities for a, more than a decade now, very directly related to climate change. And if you live in those communities, you can't just go to the store and buy dinner. I mean, they do have stores, but what's available to them is, is extremely expensive and not very nutritional and not their traditional way of life, right? They, I mean, they grew up, uh, you know, they've had generations, you know, eating caribou and eating seal and eating off the land and living in a way that, you know, has a very uh, low, um, um, a, a tiny footprint on the land. And that it, it's not something that they can just pivot to a new mode um, just because, you know, the, the climate has, has changed. So I think it's been um, remarkable to watch them respond to COVID in those communities. COVID has been a big problem in those communities. It did make it to the communities, even though they were in remote areas. Um, it has been, the level of contagion has been quite high and they've had to deal with it on top of all these challenges that are there because of, of climate change. And they've had to sort of shift their focus to, uh, to deal with that. And there's a lot of, of memory in those places. You know, it's a, uh, there's a lot of storytelling and, and a lot of oral history that uh, goes on in, in those communities that I've seen. And they very strongly remember the Spanish flu. Um, one of the places I've spent a lot of time in is, is Nome, Alaska. And Nome, Alaska lost half of its residents to the Spanish flu. And so when COVID came around, they said, we've seen this before. Like, and they, they locked down early and much more effectively than any external government was asking them to or telling them to, because the community remembered this was an, an absolutely devastating. Um, so I think we've seen them um, be, be much more in this mode of thinking globally, acting locally, that we talk about all the time in the rest of the lower 48 and the rest of the U.S. I don't know that we're very good at. Um, and with these problems now both at their front doors, um, I, I give them uh, tremendous credit for, for being really good at that, at that mindset and that approach and, um, and really remembering through the generations, you know, what worked and what didn't and, and, and how to move forward. Hey, Jim, uh, can, I, can I comment quickly something here? So I, I actually think that the, this, this indirect impacts of climate change on people are happening in the lower 48. You know, like you see wildfires, people losing their homes to wildfires, people being displaced by hurricanes and floods, people losing livelihoods to drought. I think that what we are missing is understanding there is a connection between those things and climate change. You know, and obviously the people, um, the native people probably can see those connections clearer. I think that the problem for us here is the fact that we have failed to, to understand that there is a connection between these uh, uh, climate disasters and climate change. And, uh, and that I believe is, is the real problem of us when we don't seem to understand climate change. You know, this also speaks to a, a point, Jim, that you were making, you know, last year which had to do sort of with, the, if I can phrase it correctly, it's the conflict between sort of the, the individual responsibility and community responsibility. And it sounds like, actually, all of you mentioned it last year, 
And it sounds like they understand that a little bit better yeah, in the Arctic where you've been. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a great way to paraphrase it. And I think that's definitely a, a strong sense I get when visiting those communities is that the, um, you know, the community health and, and the future of the community and the future of the next generations um, is, is really paramount. And you know, if individuals need to, to make adjustments to prioritize that community health, then, then that's what happens. That's what they do. It's, that, it's sort of the obvious thing to do. And um, you can see the rest of our culture here in the left, the lower 48 and, and beyond, um, you know, the, the individual freedoms are uh, somehow always come to the forefront and, instead of the, you know, community responsibility, community future. Yeah. Um, I'm also wondering, just sort of in a different level as a scientist, has the emergence of the Delta variant and now Omicron affected your work on climate change? Um, and how are scientists trying to meet those challenges? Um, it has definitely affected it. It's affected it probably in, a, in the, a similar way to what many people have experienced in terms of supply chain issues and restrictions on travel and those kind of things. I mean, much of my work involves going somewhere and making measurements, right? Measuring the the loss of the sea ice, measuring the increase in the waves in the Arctic, measuring the erosion at the coastline in the Arctic, those kind of things. It's a very hands-on field that I'm in. And so that re requires, you know, a lot of travel and expeditions and the supplying those expeditions and getting a lot of equipment and gear. And we build a lot of custom equipment for this. And all of that has been really um, just impacted by, by the supply chain issues. Everything's been slowing down. So it's, it's harder to do our work. It's harder to make the measurements. Um, there are two efforts I'm involved in that are really trying to continue long time series, you know, to really be continue to demonstrate uh, the changes that we see. And um, you know, having a long time series, a long data record interrupted because you can't get there to change the batteries on the instrument. That is just the most painful thing to me at a very personal level. You know, I really invested, you know, a lot of time, those 20 years trying to keep some of these, these data records going. And so we now, unfortunately, have a few gaps um, in them. If things have gotten better in that, you know, we have, um, we have found ways to, to get out there and do the work. But even as we do it now, and as we all you know, we're all vaccinated on my team and we all wear a mask and we all go do our work. Um, we still have these restrictions that, that mean that I can't involve as many students. We keep the teams really small because that's lower risk, right? So now I'm missing an opportunity to train the next generation of scientists because they're not getting to come to the field and see it and have that hands-on experience. And I'm also missing the opportunity to do more outreach and engagement when I'm there. You know, I, I, we were just talking about the local communities on the northern slope, the northern coast of Alaska. And one of my favorite things about working up there has been getting to know people up there and getting to learn how they see that environment and their traditional knowledge. And now the last thing I want to do is go knock on someone's door just in case I am unwittingly carrying a variant. I, you know, so now I don't have that engagement either. So um, I, I think the, the good part of the story is we, we have developed protocols to keep some of this work going. And I think we're, we're, we're back to getting most of the data that uh, I... I hope to get. And uh, so that part that from the initial pandemic, um, we've sort of solved most of that problem, but now we're still missing out on that human part of how we do science. And, and I think that part is, is really important. I think we don't have much future uh, with our science if we don't keep bringing the people along with us as we do the work. Yeah, interesting. Actually, that, that sort of leads us to Angelique because I, I think you've had some of the same issues, haven't you, Angelique? Um, yeah, you want to explain it a little bit? I know you've got a presentation. You want to explain first a little bit about Station Aloha and what you've been doing? Because that whole issue of a time series that Jim talked about, something that I know has been very important to you. Yeah, absolutely. We, we're facing very similar challenges. Um, if we want to start the presentation, I can, I can speak to these, to these issues. So part of my job is, is really what I call spreading the gospel of hot which is helping people understand what the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series does. And similar to what Jim has been talking about, we are monitoring the open ocean to evaluate changes in the ecosystem, the biology, the physics, the chemistry. And we do this at a place called Station Aloha. Um, this is a long-term oligotrophic habitat assessment. Um, this program has been running with a huge team of people since 1988. Um, and I'd say it's, it's about time we, we start paying attention because 
we're seeing uh, data emerge out of these time series, which if we think about our impact on the planet, 30 years is a pretty short time series, but it's some of the longest time series that we have in terms of understanding the open ocean. Um, it has been a challenge, just like Jim has described, to maintain our monthly cruises, to maintain the, the personnel, to, to do all of that with, in the beginning, you know, the quarantines, pre-cruise, the going to, to see in a mask, the reduced personnel, the lack of student volunteers, the inability to engage in any outreach, um, either with the local populations or other populations. Um, have, we weren't able to have visiting scientists come in as well. So there were large impacts to the program as a whole um, in terms of the regularity that we were able to monitor these ecosystems and the ability of us uh, to involve other people in the program. Um, we also have gaps. Uh, those gaps are, are, are related to same as Jim was talking about, um, some supply chain issues, but the entirety of oceanography was stalled due to the COVID. So that created a backlog of uh, lost ship time. There were nearly 300 days of ship time. Um, so various uh, ships within the fleet for UNALs that had science that was planned and weren't able to conduct that science for various reasons, travel or supplies, um, other issues. And so that has rippled into 2022 as well, where we're still dealing with people who didn't even get their projects off the ground in 2020 and are trying to, to play catch up. So that, that whole issue, I think that's it's broad, particularly for sciences like oceanography that require a lot of logistical support, um, but it's hurt, it's hurt science, geosciences as a whole. Did you, you had some more slides you wanted to show though, right? Yeah, I didn't want to see if you want to follow up on that. Great, so back to the, the gospel of Hoth. Um, this is one of, I think, the most important um, important data sets that we have within the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series, and we call this the Aloha Curve. So what you're seeing in red is, is the Keeling Curve. It's the change in CO2 in the atmosphere that's being recorded at Mauna Loa. And in blue is what we are doing Aloha, where we're looking at the increase in CO2 in the upper ocean over time. In this plot, this was the first publication that showed some of this data. We're seeing that increase from 1989 all the way to 2015. So CO2 increases in the atmosphere, CO2 increases in the ocean. That changes the acidity of seawater. So we're seeing this process called ocean acidification. Next slide. And I show these data because they are data, right? There, there's no um, debate here. We're showing the data that had been collected over 30 years. And what, how has COVID impacted the carbon chemistry of the atmosphere? Um, Chip made mention of this. This is a paper that came out in late 2020 that was showing that we did have a brief respite in emissions during COVID, about a 17% drop. I think that's important for two reasons. One, it shows that we can reduce our emissions if we so desire. Um, there are big changes, transportation, um, the ways in which we get goods and services that led to this drop, you know, people sort of locked in their home, not conducting daily activities. Um, but I think it's important because it does show that if we change our actions, we can reduce CO2 in, in the upper ocean as well as in the atmosphere. Um, next slide. And also, as Chip mentioned, this is still preliminary data from rhodium for the 2021 greenhouse emissions. Um, we bounced back really quick. Uh, so we saw a 6.2% increase in these preliminary numbers. And it was people getting out and traveling again. You know, we've seen tons of tourists come into Hawaii, for example, which is good for you know local industry, but also brings us back up to you know our previous carbon footprints where we're looking at transportation and power, all these things that are going to take a real fundamental shift in the way we uh, live our lives in order to um, reduce these emissions. So, you know, they dropped, they're coming back. Um, next slide. And one thing about the ocean is it's, it's a great integrator of, of, of emissions. So there was no respite from change for the oceans. These are the updated PCO2 data into 2019, 2020. Um, so, you know, a little 17% decline in the atmosphere um, the oceans see almost none of that. Uh, we'll see how it goes once we update the data. Uh, but we're, we're still walking along the same path we were prior to COVID. 
Uh, next slide. And so this, this came out recently. Uh, this was actually just a couple of days ago. Um, this is a, a paper that um, from Chang and co-authors um, that's looking at the global heat content in the upper 2000 meters of the water column. And in this case, what they're doing is looking at that heat content relative to a baseline of 1981 to 2010. And you can see there are years that were colder and you start to cross in, in the mid nineties, this threshold where you're higher than that baseline to the point that 2021 was the hottest year ever recorded by humans in the ocean. Right? And this is the, this is the real power of time series is we're not debating. We're, we're showing data that are collected from you know, a range of buoys and, and ships and, and moorings and gliders and floats all across the ocean that make a really convincing and I think powerful case for this emergent change, um, both in carbon content as well as in heat. And we start to get a better understanding of how those changes are gonna impact ecosystems. And just got one or two more slides. So the, another thing I've been involved in that we might talk about at some point is if we look at these emission scenarios that Chip has discussed, um, you know, reaching that uh, no warmer than 1.5 degrees, no warmer than two degrees, there are a range of models that predict which track we're gonna be on when we're gonna hit these, these baselines, whether we stay in the very high CO2 emissions, um, you know, plus the 20% that's unreported, uh, whether we go into intermediate or low, every single one of these scenarios, every single possibility of staying at 1.5 degrees warming requires negative emission technologies. And that means that we need to develop technologies that remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Next slide. And one way one might do that is, um, you know, it's a, it's a form of geoengineering in some ways, quite contentious but I was part of this National Academy of Sciences uh, consensus study report. Um, we've now published that report in December of 2021. This was um, supported really with the, by a, a company called Climate Works that was um, really looking at ocean CDR, carbon dioxide removal, as a mechanism to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and help us meet those temperature guidelines. That mechanism is secondary to reduction of emissions. Um, no part of this report uh, suggests that reduction of emissions shouldn't be the first step. Because I, I want to just point out what the key recommendation was, because it's, it's big for the future of ocean funding, um, is that to inform societal decisions, which would be a broad climate response mitigation portfolio, we need to start to understand how these various mechanisms of carbon dioxide removal should be implemented. And we should start funding that at the federal and international level immediately. And really to address current knowledge gaps. We've got a few scenarios. We could add iron to the surface ocean. We could use wave pumps. We could grow seaweed. All of these things, some sound a little crazier than others, but are potential ways for increasing the carbon sink in the open ocean. And we're at the point where we've walked so far up that CO2 line that we actually have to start considering these various geoengineering strategies as a way to maintain that warming within sort of a safe body temperature like Chip describes it. So I just wanted to, to show that data. There's one last slide. Um, this was the cover of the um, IPCC report that came out. Um, it's the first time they've used an artist for the cover of their report. Um, this is work by Elisa Singer, and in describing this work, you know, make, she makes mention that as we witness our planet transforming around us, we have to watch, listen, listen and measure, and that's what the time series are doing. Um, but now, you know, we're at the point where we have to respond, um, and we are now talking about things that, you know, even five, ten years ago uh, were verboten in many ways. You know, for example, geoengineering the oceans to help remove CO2 from the atmosphere. That's, that's something I know that was very important to, to Camillo. Um, I know that when it comes to battling climate change, one, one personal commitment you make, Camillo, is, that, is to plant a million trees. Can you, can you catch us up on that and tell me how it's going and um, how are your seedlings growing? Yeah, actually I had to uh, 
tell you how it got there though, like uh, the, all of the science, the data is pretty solid, especially for us as scientists that are working on these things. It started eventually over time getting to you, you know, I started to realize that I was having this weird feeling. Uh, it was not a pleasant feeling every time that I was working on these things. For a long time, I thought that it was depression. Then I came to realize that it was sadness, you know, and I honestly got sick of being sad. Like we are doing this thing and people don't want to add on it. We decided to put words to action and we started to work on these solutions. No, let's just stop talking. Let's start walking the talk, so to speak. So we started this project uh, to plant trees. And before I show you some of the things that we had done there, I want to tell you that there, is, there are phases though. When you look at big ach achievements of humanity, like when we went to the moon or when we decided to go fly, those big projects go through phases. You know, phase one is when somebody proposes the idea and they say, that's crazy, right? Phase two is when you actually start working on it and you realize there is a moment there of super excitement when you realize actually this is possible, we can do it. And then it's phase three when you actually go and do it and you achieve your thing. So the idea here is that we can uh, plant enough trees. Uh, I am talking about exactly the same thing that Angelique was pointing out, but rather than in the oceans, we wanna do it on land where we had plenty of land to do it and a lot of species. The idea is to plant enough trees to offset most of humanity's carbon emissions up to now. Right. So and that's that's the general idea. So I went already when I already went through phase one, which is to think that this was crazy. My project right now is in phase two, which is to when we started to work and started to realize that we actually can do this. Can we share a quick video now that, that, that we prepare for you guys? So how I came to realize that this is doable was to, to understand that there is a huge need of people and people is eager to work on these things. So we decided to start walking the talk, we joined with a local group and um, of, of uh, individuals that love working with plants and I capitalized on their expertise to produce seedlings. And uh, Barbara, this is Barbara, she's like my rock star. We produced 10,000 seedlings in a couple months and we had them growing in the nursery. Then we came and picked them up. We took them in a U-Haul and we started to, to, to get to work on the site. So I got volunteers. I had all of my students. It was mandatory for them to come and participate on this thing, you know, like, and again, I just don't want you to know that this is bad. I want you to be part of the solution. I, I partner up with a lot of different NGOs. These individuals that you see there are my uh, capital so to speak, and these are the holes. I don't know if you guys managed to see there. We dug 10,000 holes. I got my captains. We went through some training just to ensure that every tree was planted accordingly. And then um, now that I had every captain, we invited 2,000 people. Can you imagine this? We went to the a local news channel. We told everybody come, and next thing we know, we had 2,000 people showing up there. We had the people organized in, in groups. Every family, school, uh, classroom, they came. They were assigned to a team captain, and then we started to plant trees. And it, seriously, it was a lot of planning to get there. But in two hours, we managed to plant uh, over 10,000 trees. Look at that kid, man! I love it just to see. That kid getting the, his hands dirty. You can imagine the footprint that that's doing in the brains in the brain of that kid. You know, an individual that ten years later, twenty years later, is going to start voting in a, his conscience when we start choosing politicians. But I had to tell you, I was fascinated. My, for me, it was going from thinking that this is crazy to thinking that this is very doable. Once we decided to go and do it, we mobilized two thousand people for this planting event, and. Uh, Right now, obviously, COVID put a, a huge break for us as well. Um, but we decided to do was to actually use that as an opportunity to improve the way that we do this. Now we obviously had all of the protocols to follow with COVID. We go and plant trees with smaller groups. Right now, we are planting trees at a rate of about 100, 500 trees per Saturday section. So these are about groups of four four people to 20 people, everything by the COVID following the standards. And now our rate is about, again, 500 trees per section. Look at the beauty net. I, oh my God, I get the goosebumps. But just knowing again, just knowing again that the eagerness of people to be part of the solution. Or what we gotta do is to start putting a science to make this solution work. And that's what we are working on right now, building the science to ensure that, that this is bulletproof. You know, I don't wanna try to do the same thing again because we identify multiple sections 
but we are in our way to, to make this happen. And eventually at some point, I, I'm telling you, I'm gonna die one day, I'm gonna go to heaven and God is gonna let me get in there when I say, I planted a, a million trees for you in the planet. I'm not gonna tell him I published a, a hundred scientific papers. That's go, not gonna cut it for him. But I'm confident that me saying I planted you a million trees is gonna be my ticket to get into heaven. And if you guys want to get into heaven, I promise you, I will grant you a very nice little reference if you join my project and come and help me and plant trees. <laughs> I'll be there tomorrow, how's that? There, there you go. Okay, I guess I'm gonna to have to ask the tough question of the, of the, of the other panelists. Is, um, is Camillo crazy? No, is he's this, not. He's the exact okay. type of enthusiasm that we need. <laughs> <laughs> I already went through the phase one thinking that I was crazy. I had to tell you for the longest of time, I thought this idea is crazy. And there were many times that I doubted myself. It wasn't until I saw the people coming that I realized this is actually doable. You know, all what we gotta do is plan it, just like we plan scientific projects, but apply to a social service. And um, I, yeah, I already, I had already passed the phase of thinking that I was crazy. I don't think I am anymore. I just, I just need to get the thing sorted out to move to final phase, which is to get those million trees done. And I wanna do it not in, in by 2050, I wanna do it in, in one day. So, and I'm telling you, let me, let me give you my maths. In Hawaii, we had a million people. Let's imagine that 90% of them don't care about climate change. I only get 10% of them caring. That's 100,000 people. All what I got to do is to figure out a protocol in which every one of those individuals plant, plant 10 trees. 100,000 people, that's your million trees that we can plant in one day. Again, it's just a matter of coordination and planning, and we can do this a lot faster than what we think. And you have the land? Oh. Well, that is was part of the problem right now. Originally, you cannot imagine the amount of people that deny us access to plant the trees because again, they thought they was crazy. Well, fortunately for us, we got a uh, few land owners that say, you know what, go for it. If you give me the trees, go for it. We got a, a, a ranch called Gunster Ranch. The, the, there is a, a local NGO who is directed by Jeff Dumpster and he say, you know what, go for it, man. Once we prove it, now we had actually a lot of more land available to us. So we had actually more land right now available than, than we had capacity to plant trees. And once we start proving the concept, a lot of people is going to get on board with this. So Camilla, one of the in, the, in the ocean, the equivalent to planting trees in the geoengineering would be to add nutrients um, to get the phytoplankton to grow and to sequester carbon in the same way that they do on land. Um, in doing that, you run into other nutrient limitations. Is that something to worry about here in Hawaii? Well, one of the things that I was thinking about the oceans, again, I haven't really worked, so I don't really have too much expertise on that specific field, despite the fact that I am a marine biologist. But my thought is the fact that we have all of these areas in coastal areas around the world that have this problem of eutrophication, where there has been a lot of nutrients actually dumping there. So that actually creates prime conditions for us, for instance, to have a macroalgae growing this thing. Now they have these algae farms that produce agar. It's a very good business for many countries. So my thought is, rather than us going and tamping potentially with the nutrient cycle of the oceans, let's rather use those areas that will benefit actually from us removing nutrients in the Gulf of Mexico, for instance. I know that's a huge problem, especially at the delta of the Mississippi River, where you had the nutrients coming from all of these rivers from agricultural land. So again, it's just a matter of getting to work on it and just realizing that there are opportunities where we can do this, where these things can actually work well. Yeah, yeah. macroalgal production is covered in that National Academy report. It's it's something that, as you suggest, is getting a good bit of traction. Mm -hmm. No, what, 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 a question from the audience was like, what, what kind of trees are you planting? Oh yeah, that's an excellent question. Not all of the trees are the same. And in fact, one of the first things that we had to do when we were going to plant trees is to cut down trees. It's kind of ironic, right? For us to plant trees, we got to cut trees. So one of the problems in Hawaii is that over 80% of the land has been transformed, right? So original forest was cut down for agriculture. And once that land was abandoned, that land got overgrown by introduced species. So we had tons of species right now that have been introduced that are brutal on how bad they are for the environment. You had things like halicoa, albicia, guava trees. So unfortunately, the first thing that we had to do is to clear the land from those introduced species. And then in my case, I only plant nappy trees. There is some debate 
among local people here that works on these things to, to plant trees that are have been introduced that are not invasive. I had personal reservations on that action. In my case, as an ecologist, I, I only plant a native trees. And we are working, I have multiple students trying to figure out the life cycles to ensure that we can maximize the production of these seedlings. So right now we have capacity to produce about five species of native trees by the thousands, in fact, by the millions, if we want to. Everything sorted out scientifically to ensure that we can produce tons of native species now. And, and you know, when last we spoke, um, one of the big issues you were talking about was that, you know, a lot of these, these newly planted trees, you got to water them. Um, and you were working on methods to make sure that happened because you were saying there's a big, there's a big die off. There is a huge die off, but actually that is beautiful how, how good that is. You know, like we normally get 10% survival when we plan and we never come back, right? And a lot of people see that as a terrible thing. Oh my God, 90% mortality, that's crazy. And I thought, what are you talking about? That's beautiful. If you think about what happens in nature, a single coa tree produces 100,000 seeds of which only one of them should survive, right? So that's one out of 100,000. When we talk about 10% survival, we are talking about that 10,000 seeds out of that one tree are gonna survive. So we are making things 10,000 better than nature. So again, it's one of the problems that we had today is the misconception that high mortality is a bad thing when in reality it's a natural process that actually we are improving quite a lot. Now, the other problem of having huge survival by helping the tree a lot with water and weeding and all of these things is that we create individuals that might be able, not might be able to survive that well later on when they are in their own. So the process of natural selection is actually good to have it playing a role in our, in our plantings. But I understand that a lot of people don't really see very well you having 90% of your trees dying. So we are working on different, again, putting a science and engineering to ensure that our trees survive. And we have several technologies that we are working on. I had a patent now in, a, in one of the devices to ensure that uh, once we plant the trees, they had higher chance of to survival. But again, I want to point out to people that seeing 10% survival is actually 10,000 time, 10, times better than what it is in nature. Interesting. You know, what I'd like to do now is, is maybe uh, turn some of these questions over to, uh, to our audience out there that have been sending some questions in. Um, but first, as I, I need to look at some of the questions, I guess I'd like to start with, um, um, you know, I, I, when, we, when last we spoke, it was, we're all scientists and oftentimes loathe to wade into to politics. Um, but is anyone concerned about the 2022 midterm elections and, and what needs to be done in terms of promoting science and fighting both COVID and climate change? I'll take a, it's a quick stab at just in my, um... One of the key frustrations I have as a scientist that and we feel like sometimes that, um, that uh, the, the status of science in the U.S. right now is is in decline, right? That we don't. Um, there are a lot of people who deny the climate science that's going on and just you know pick and choose what is convenient to them to believe in, um, even when we show pretty clear signals and clear data. And what drives me crazy about this, as a bit of a technologist and someone who builds instrumentation and you know works on technology in addition to science, is that um, all of these, all this misinformation is getting propagated through technology, right? I mean, almost everyone is walking around with one of these in their pocket, right? This is my iPhone, and it's incredibly powerful and complex. And most people have no idea how it works, right? They have no idea how it connects to the internet. They have no idea the battery technology. They have no idea the processor and the operating system and the low level code. Or the high, they just don't know any of it. Um, and yet they can use it to do such effective harm, basically, you know, to, to spread the disinformation that just carries us backwards as, as a, a community at large. And so I find that in, so ironic as to be painful, you know, that we're able to, to use these technological advantages to basically take our global society backwards. Um, and so the, I th when I think about the upcoming election, I think about um, all of the, the sort of finger pointing and, and half truths that are thrown around. I think like, God, how, you know, we've, we've, we've created our own system to do this and do it incredibly effectively um, with the very thing that's, you know, uh, supposed to be the answer. 
Hey, Jim, I, I, I want to add something to this that is a personal thought of mine about this problem that we see today, because for me, one of the things that this situation is revealing today is the poor education system that we have, not only in the United States, but everywhere. And I see just the incapacity of people to think critically the information that they get. And I try to question why that's the case, you know, why is people is not judging this information more critically? And I think it had to do with the fact that we are failing our kids, both at the high school and the university to ensure an education system where they can judge that information more crit critically. When you look, when you see our country, I find it mind blowing that half of the people cannot get basic concepts in a science and I, for instance, it frustrates me when you see reporters saying that recommendations from the CDC are confusing. Why are you talking confusing? There are very clear recommendations there. Basically, what we're talking there is your the intellectual incapacity to comprehend processes that are complex. And I try to understand what that's the case. So it points out, I believe, to a more social problem of society overall. And I personally, I just don't know where it comes from. I think that it comes from education. Somehow we are failing our children by not funding well the, the teachers, by not giving good support to the parents. But uh, I think that this is pointing out to a more serious problem in society than, than what we see today. Uh, Camilo, that's a very good point. I, I just want to add that a lot, uh, a lot of the education must involve the parents. Um, my, members of my family are deeply involved in education. And we've been talking uh, lately about the fact that in the science classroom, you know, the uh, um, junior school and middle school science classroom, and even in the high schools, my family members are seeing children come in believing that earth is flat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, they are answering questions on tests for the purpose of getting a good grade, but fundamentally, you know, and they'll, they'll, they'll answer the question correctly that earth is spherical, but, uh, because at home, there are certain belief systems that are guiding their parents. In fact, getting concepts of related to evolution, getting concepts about uh, Earth's position in the solar system and in the universe uh, across to these children is like swimming upstream when family members at home don't believe these same fundamental, basic, proven scientific concepts. So yes, the education system is critical, but also uh, what takes place at home is critical as well. Well, and that is, again, the importance of these laws that are being proposed by the Democrats, I believe, today, you know, like trying to provide some kind of support to families. Although I think that the problem that you are pointing out is so critical, I, it would be nice to identify how do we fix this thing, because I'm totally on board with you on this thing. One of the things that scares me the most is to engage in conversations with people that actually had use evidence, pick up evidence to support ideas that I know are crazy. Like, for instance, this idea that you are talking about the planet being flat, I, I, I was shocked. Uh, several times talking to people that totally believe the thing and they use scientific evidence that I don't know where it comes from. So yeah, it is a, it's a tough problem to address. <laughs> so, I think on a different level, you know, oh, sorry. I, I was just gonna say on a, on a similar topic, but on a different level is the fact that we as scientists traditionally aren't trained to present our work in, in sort of sound bites or in mm -hmm. ways that are digestible. Um, mm -hmm. Not saying that we need to make all of our research, you know, Twitter ready or anything like that, but I think what we see in this last IPCC report, you know, there's a lot of material there. Clearly, they've worked with social scientists. Clearly, they've worked with, you know, other journalists to try to um, put that information in a more digestible way, creating, you know, single PDF slides with bullet points. And we have to do that more often. It's an added level of work, and it's something that you know, it, another, yet another thing we're not necessarily trained to do, but I do think that there's a burden of that that we have to take on, particularly this next generation of scientists when there has been some erosion in the confidence of, of science in general, particularly geosciences. Uh, it's been proven that the oil and gas industry has funded uh, groups that are sowing uh, doubt, the same strategy used by the tobacco industry uh, and this has been going on uh, for several decades, and they've been having um, a significant impact. They have they have tremendously slowed progress in the United States, and I put a link uh, in the Q and A box here for a paper that came out in the in the uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, 
which, uh, which shows data that the more a, a member of Congress uh, votes against environmental initiatives, which would include climate change policy, the more funding is available from the oil and gas industry. So this is a huge, huge problem. Our congressional members are, um, are being paid by the oil and gas industry, not all of them, but there are uh, a significant number of, oil, uh, of congressional members who are paid by the oil and gas industry to stand in the way of significant po uh, climate policy moving forward in the United States. And the whole world watches the United States uh, at this point with great frustration over the fact that our system uh, is preventing us from reestablishing the leadership role that, that we've traditionally had in this field. It's funny, here in the United States, that's called lobbying. In my country, that's called corruption, you know? Um, I was just wondering whether, uh, um, whether as scientists, you feel like you can get out there a bit more, either on social media or, um, or in the press or on, on TV. Is it, or you see yourselves becoming a little bit more activist? Well, there are a couple of things to that question there. One is first to have the opportunity and the reality is that we are competing against Justin Bieber and all kinds of other people that dominate public's attention. So we don't really have too many opportunities to do this. But the other thing that needs to happen is what Angelique pointed out, which is that we need to have training on this. You know, I don't know if you have seen, for instance, the latest debate between Paul Ro, uh, Ron Paul and, uh, sorry, this Senator Paul and uh, Dr. Fauci how Dr. Fauci was trying to make a point and, and Ron Paul was com constantly interfering, you know? So that's training. So when you don't wanna have a message being delivered to another person, what you do is you raise your voice while the other person is talking. It turns out that that's part of the training that they had, you know? So we need to somehow be trained on the same skills so that when we had those shots or, or message is gonna be delivered and it's gonna be delivered well. And unfortunately we don't go through that training. So, so you can potentially go through this presentation alone and you will see hundreds of errors that we have made that, 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 are, that could be fixed by us also having this training on media communication and yeah. One of the, one of the panelists that we had last year, um, Dr. Aaron Bernstein, um, he was concerned, concerned that, that one of the ways COVID is affecting um, the work on climate change was that it was sort of pushing climate change off the agenda. And that he said that this, this often happens. That you, you have a big, you have a major crisis and all of a sudden people can say, well, I'll worry about climate change after we deal with the pandemic. Uh, are you guys concerned about that? It could... Yes. Uh, the tyranny of the urgent, right? It always dominates mm -hmm. the day. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. that's where teamwork, for instance, you know, Congress, teams of people uh, need to help uh, leaders tackle multiple critical goals, critical issues simultaneously. Um, it's such a shame that the uh, stimulus money around the world that was used to pull the economy out of the recession caused by COVID-19 did not have a much larger component dedicated to making the pivot uh, to renewable energy. Um, there was a significant investment in renewable energy systems around the world, but not nearly enough uh, to put us on the pathway to 1.5 or even two degrees Celsius. Um, and so that's a failure of our leaders globally uh, that that was a, a lost opportunity. So um, not only did COVID divert our attention, um, but it also provided an opportunity, right? And there's opportunity buried in every crisis. Um, and we need to be ready for those as they continue to occur in the future. So, and I don't know whether you have an answer to this question or not, but one, another question from uh, someone attending the webinar. Um, are enough students and kids going into these fields, you know, science and climatology, um, or are we short of students and graduates? Um, and what can we do to encourage students and kids to go into these fields? I'll try that one, at least from what I'm seeing here. I think um, 
that in general, we're still seeing a strong pipeline of students and, and starting to see little upticks in a more diverse student population. The geosciences has been predominantly male and white for a very long time and has a real diversity problem that is not talked about enough. Um, but it, I do see little um, bits of improvement here and there. And, you know, in this last year and um, the year before, in terms of graduate students applying to um, the program that I teach in and where I would advise students, there's still very strong candidates coming through. I do understand that more, uh, more broadly across higher education, there is perhaps a crisis emerging in which um, some people are not returning to campus, not returning to schools, and that enrollment is, is down a bit across all of there's an NPR piece on it yesterday. Enrollment is down across all sectors of of uh, undergraduate, you know, bachelor level education. So it's yet to be seen there. But I, uh, I think I am somewhat optimistic for us to have the next generation of scientists who can keep going with the kind of data records that Angelique and I have been, you know, putting a lot of our careers towards, and that that will keep going. What I really wish for is a general population that's more science literate, that's more able to have these discussions where present some data, we talk about the hypothesis, we see if the hypothesis is valid or not. And if they have some alternate hypothesis, something that they heard on the street or heard from a family member, they can really assess it critically and, and come to their own conclusion and not just, you know, um, you know make uh, a, a set of a story up that is convenient to them that reinforces something that they already uh, believed. And that, that, you know, that, that I see is the bigger problem. So, I'm not worried about the, the experts that become the next PhDs. I think that pipeline is still there. I'm worried about the general public really just understanding uh, how we do science and, and, and tr it really comes down to trust, right? And trust is a hard thing to build. Trust is something that's usually built over a lot of time and effort on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but we need more throughput. We need to get to the point where we as a scientific community are trusted in the larger world uh, you know, at, at scale. Um, and I don't know how to go from, I know how to do it on a one-on-one. -on -one. If I spend enough time with someone, um, I usually can get there, right? But I, we don't have the time to do that one-on-one -on -one with every person in the world. We've got to do it at scale. And that's the, I don't know how to do that. I would just echo those comments. Um, you know, I, I think we've, we've still got a, a pretty amazing stream of, of students that are interested in the geosciences, you know, a passionate group of students that really want to affect change and, and care for their environment in the various ways that, um, that they're interested. I also think you, we have to mention that it's a real challenge for a lot of these students, um, new students coming in, particularly people with families. Um, one of the things we've absolutely seen in this era of COVID is you know, the mental health challenges of isolation um, that have been inflicted on, on students at various levels. Um, you know, so there's there's some some issues. I think COVID has put up some barriers to the student population that we have to acknowledge at multiple levels. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, uh, <laughs> I I just I couldn't agree more with with what you said, Jim. So, if anything, COVID the effect COVID has had on climate change in some way is sort of the the learning loss that a lot of students have, have undergone. Um, I think that I know in education that's a big issue. Like, how do you how do you recapture that? Or have we got a have we got a whole generation of students that are you know just one or two steps behind? Uh, but what I'd like to do now is maybe go around the room and, and and see if you've got maybe some summary remarks and some insights that you've gained or you'd like to leave us with. Um, Chip, is there, is there anything you'd like to add to the discussion at this point to wrap things up since we're kind of close to running out of time? Yeah, thank you. Um, this is hard for me uh, because I'm constantly criticized for leaving audiences without hope. And uh, I'm so embedded in the science related to climate change that uh, I follow all the papers that come out and uh, we, the, the scientists are doing an incredible job of uh, tracking um, the growing instability of global biophysical systems, major ocean currents, um, the ice sheets, the alpine glaciers, coral reefs, uh, the great Arctic pine forests, um, the Amazon basin. Um, 
all around the planet, we're seeing amazing negative impacts to, um, to systems that really uh, we depend on for our livelihood, for our, for our natural resources. But where I uh, do see um, the opportunity for an amazing future is if people, once they come in contact with the facts, with the science here, and they come to realize that we are putting our only planet at risk, we are putting our only home at risk, and can come together to fall in love once again with planet Earth, and to fall in love with each other, to quit this fighting and this factionalism, and to instead realize that unless we pull in one direction as a single human community and make this pivot to a clean future, to a healthy future, both in what we eat, the natural resources that we use, um, the forms of energy that we utilize, how we move in transportation systems. This is a, this is a, fully consuming tran transformation of human society is what's needed here. And as has been mentioned, it is a crisis. It's an emergency. We cannot afford uh, to wait any longer. But the good news is that the future could be an amazing place for our children and grandchildren. If we can just get through these uh, classic human problems of uh, bias and competition, and instead work in one direction uh, because there's only one planet and uh, we have to get this right. There's no alternative. Hey, Jim, do you have any thoughts along these lines? Mostly that I would also like to end on a note of optimism. Um, and I do see you know, uh, tremendous energy and uh, intent in the, the youth and the students that I'm around. <laughs> That's really exciting. That's really encouraging. And, uh, you know, to just end on the idea that, it, um, that the solution to, to despair is action. And, you know, I, I share a lot of these, my colleagues' uh, feelings of just sadness. You know, when you get depressed, when you, I mean, I go up to the Arctic and I see less ice every year and it is just plain old depressing. Um, but I feel when I can do anything, uh, not just report it, but do things in my own life, then I, you know, it, it feels better. And to try to, um, to showcase those things, uh, not to brag about them, but to nudge people in the same direction and be like, you know, hey, I rode my bike to work today. It was great. You want to try it with me tomorrow? You know, uh, hey, we're putting solar on the house this year. What do you think? You know, um, hey, my neighbor just got an electric car. Man, that thing's cool. I went for a ride in it. It's great. You know, like, and just bring everyone around you, even on that really small scale, um, uh, it just starts to, you know, feel like you're building momentum. So, um, those are the things that I'm looking to do that, that try to, you know, um, basically reinforce my own optimism when I'm, when I'm feeling a low point. Um, and, uh, and the thing that's always best when I'm, when I'm really trying to lean into that approach is to just hang out with some kids, my own son or his friends, or, you know, just, um, man, the, uh, there's a lot of promise there and a lot of energy there. And, uh, you know, that's, that's to be harnessed, pun acknowledged. It sounds like that each of you have some, some fairly specific viable solutions that, that, that you'd like to see people start doing. Um, I know um, Chip actually had a, 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 some effect on me when he was talking about last year about, um, um, what was a sort of factory farming? I think was one of the issues that Jim was talking about and how, how that was affecting climate change. And, you know, the more he started thinking about it, uh, and, and, and frankly, Chip was talking about how he became a vegetarian, in part because he wanted to be more responsible. And I can't claim to have become a vegetarian, but I'll tell you, you had a big influence on me. I just cut way back on, on the kind of factory farming food I was eating. Um, and good, I know we live longer too. <laughs> perhaps <laughs> there's some other issues involved, but um, Camilla, you know, you're you're you've got a fairly practical approach to this whole thing, which is to plant trees. 
Yeah, and I'm telling you, I love it. It's an, uh, everybody that comes to do this thing sweat like crazy, hard work. But I'm telling you, when you walk away from this, you will feel very happy. I know that every one of you are looking for solutions about things to do. And I have to tell you that I work on this with my daughter. Actually, I should have mentioned that much earlier. She's the one that came out with this idea of planting trees. And actually, she's kind of my boss now. She's kind of the one driving this whole thing. And just to acknowledge that I'm from. But one of the things that I want to finish with is that, yes, every one of us can do something. Every American produces over 20 tons of carbon. So if you just want to care about your own carbon footprint, all what you got to do is plant 20 trees. The calculation, I already did it. So if you want to do something, starting with yourself, you produce 20 tons of carbon, go and plant the 10, the 10 trees. And I, I want to plant a million trees myself. I'm not going to do it alone. So I would love if the people from Hawaii come and give me a hand anytime next time that we do this. Well, speaking of that, Camilla, can you uh, tell people where to go to volunteer? <laughs> We are actually, the whole project is in a standby because we need to prepare several things, bottlenecks that we encounter. Once those bottlenecks are overcome, is that we're going to go, well, at this moment, I don't want to rush a product to market, so to speak. You know, we already identified several problems that need to be overcome, especially with the COVID situation. Once that thing is done, I'm hoping to have a program in place that anyone can come and plant trees right now. So at the current time, we're just planting trees here and there whenever we had an opportunity, but nothing as, as large as we did prior to the COVID, nor as big as we want to do it once we overcome these problems. But I think if people wanted to know a little bit more, they could simply Google your name and the tree planting in Hawaii, they could probably get there. That's um, correct. Angelica, I'm going to leave the last word for you. Um, <laughs> give us some hope here. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Um, and thank you for the, the time to have this conversation because, you know, whenever I, we have these conversations, I, there was a book that came out a few years ago um, called All We Can Save. And it's an anthology by 60 uh, women climate scientists. And it's, its theme really is, is hope, but it also recognizes that it's not geoscientists that are going to solve these issues, right? It's, it's humanity. It's sociologists, it's philosophers, um, economists, uh, engineers, geoscientists. We, we do need to come together. And so that's, that's I think, the, the theme of hope and resilience that, I, I would like to, that I'd like to leave here with. Because the climate crisis is a, it's a moment of peril, right? But it's also a, a moment of, of great possibility. Um, just to build on what Jim had said, when we see what the, the climate youth, um, the youth climate movement has done in terms of transforming the, the conversation to, um, to really, really work on this portfolio of solutions that involve the ocean, you know, trees, um, and most importantly, how we utilize resources from our planet and the ways that we eat and the ways that we transport ourselves around the planet. Um, to be more mindfully connected to the world mm -hmm. around us. Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, hopefully that if there's, for me at least, one take home out of this conversation, it's that, is that we do need to think about our footprint on the planet and the ways in which we can connect with others that are trying to preserve this, this one single habitat that we have for future generations. Excellent. Well, I think I'll leave it there. This has been a wonderful webinar. And you folks have really done a wonderful job of explaining what you're up to and, and, and what's ahead of us. Uh, and I really appreciate, and I think everyone viewing does, that it's sort of threatened to find the optimism in, in, in what we're going through. Um, but I wish you a great deal of luck in your further research. Um, and I really appreciate the audience sticking with us and uh, hearing what our panelists have to say. So I want to thank you very much and end the webinar there. If that's okay. Thank you again. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.